commitment to uh, diversity and anti-structural uh, racism efforts to do that. Thank you, everybody, for coming to uh, this lecture. I'm really excited about this uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Gary Sutkin in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, and I have the great pleasure here to introduce Dr. Gita Swamy. Uh, Dr. Swamy is the first lecturer for the UMKC Health Sciences District Research Advisory Council Lecture Series. Uh, this lecture highlights the partnership between UK, UMKC, Children's Mercy, and University Health. And as a lot of you know, University Health is building a new labor and delivery and a new NICU up on the sixth floor. Uh, this image behind me is the Health Sciences District. In 2015, the leaders at a strategic retreat had an idea. We're all here in the same place. So why don't we develop a way to work more closely together, something that's good for the district, the city, and the region. And so it began. It was 2017, the formation of the UMKC Health Sciences District, and it represented a new chapter in advancing care, outreach, and health education throughout greater Kansas City. And so with that in mind, it is a great honor to introduce Dr. Gita Swamy. Uh, Gita and I trained together at McGee Women's Hospital, and I have wonderful memories of our times together, both uh, inside the hospital and working long, long hours, and then, of course, even outside the hospital around Pittsburgh, too. Um, the fun thing is over the past couple weeks, knowing that I got to introduce her, I've gotten to brag to a lot of our common friends about how I, uh, how I get to do that. Um, Gita uh, from McGee went on, of course, to bigger things. She's been at Duke since 2001 and is now uh, currently a full professor of obstetrics and gynecology with tenure. Uh, she served as the lead chair for the Duke Health System IRB. She's an associate VP for research, vice dean for scientific integrity. And relevant to this talk today, she has multiple funded studies regarding infectious diseases and pregnancy, which have resulted in more than 160 uh, publications, abstracts, and book chapters. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Dr. Swamy. Thank you all. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, shall I take this off since I'm up at the front? Will that be OK? All right. Everyone else keep them on, so then it's not <laughs> Okay, so let me see. I'm going to just see if I can um, advance this from here. Okay, great. <clears throat> so thank you all for, um, for inviting me. I don't need to put it on my disclosures for that long. But um, so I just want to um, say uh, this is the first work-related trip I've taken um, in all of COVID. So thank you um, to Dean Jackson um, and others for having me today. Um, it was nice. I really have to say how much I enjoyed my quiet time in the hotel this morning by myself with no dog and no children, but I could order coffee. I could order a second cup of coffee <laughs> and still sit there and, um, of course, do a few emails and make a few plans, but it's still um, always my, um, my uh, appreciated time. I think probably similar to Gary, I was uh, learned early on to be a good obstetrician gynecologist resident, you needed to figure out how to be a morning person. You also need to figure out how to be a night person. So it really means you need to be able to be on <laughs> all the time. Um, but thank you all so much for having me. And I'm going to um, talk a bit about vaccines, um, which is where I know Dean Jackson from, from my interactions um, in the space of uh, vaccine um, policy setting and decision making. So I do have multiple uh, disclosures to make known. Um, as a vaccine researcher, I um, work directly with industry. Uh, at this point, I actually mostly work in, um, with industry on the side of safety, uh, looking at independent safety monitoring, um, both for Pfizer and for um, Glaxo on RSV and Group B strep vaccines, actually, which I think most of you in the obstetric space um, would know m much about GBS. The pediatric side is the RSV uh, area as well. Uh, but I also have grants from federal sponsors, and I sit on a couple of um, policy setting um, committees. Uh, so I always want to make sure that people understand that, um, that it is part of my bias uh, as to where I sit and do that work. So it's important to think about what do we do every day and how does that impact the world and the community. The two most significant public health interventions cross into our world uh, from what we do, certainly hygiene, um, sanitation is one of the biggest ones, but vaccines is right up there as number two. And this is a worldwide, uh, you know, sort of commitment to how we improve the health of our population. Sadly, some of these conditions that we've near eradicated have popped up over the last few years, and we've heard more about, um, but I think we can 
hopefully continue to work on that and do better. So why would we talk about all this in the setting of pregnancy, right? Why would we think about immunizing a pregnant woman? I used to have a slide several years back that was uh, vaccines not just for children anymore. Um, and so, you know, the adult vaccination space in the United States is still quite lacking. Um, people might think that, oh, it's, it's common, you get your flu vaccine, but there are multiple vaccines recommended for adults in the United States. Um, so again, an area we can do better. I was meeting with the medical students earlier and talking about how um, how disappointing it is to know that a country like Australia is going to nearly eradicate cervical cancer um, before the end of this decade, and we are still struggling with uptake um, in, our, in our country. So, but looking at this now from the standpoint of pregnancy, why would we want to immunize a pregnant person? There aren't immunologic changes that increase a woman's susceptibility to the morbidity and mortality-related infection. So I want to be very clear, pregnant women are not immunocompromised. When I hear people say that, I think to myself, well, how do they get by every day? Um, it, they really are not compromised, but there are changes that happen in the immune system. We actually want those things to change. Otherwise, we wouldn't actually get to successful pregnancy, right? A fetus is a foreign body. So we have to figure out how to tolerate that foreign body and still combat other things that are problematic. But somewhere along the line, that milieu sometimes doesn't always work well. Um, there is a shift in the immune response and how that works. So if we can get vaccines that help to overcome that, that can be helpful. The other thing is that you know, we should be thinking at all times how to provide the best health care to the patient in front of us. So just because a person is pregnant shouldn't mean that they are necessarily excluded from any other preventive, or, or, um, preventive health care strategies or treatments simply because they are gestating. We're in a set situation where we see pregnant people on a very regular basis, right? Pregnant people are interfacing with the healthcare system um, very, very regularly in that short period of time. It's a great opportunity to give multiple vaccines when you have a series, right? Um, and so we don't want to exclude this and say this is in a primary care setting, this is in internal medicine, this is in pediatrics. We should be thinking about what are the right things to be doing during pregnancy. But when we immunize a pregnant person, we also are actually immunizing the fetus, right? So we might think of immunizations for infants. Um, the first infant dosing of vaccine, right, is with hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, but after that, the rest of the vaccines start around two months, and there's a whole series of vaccines. Active immunization of the infant takes some time, right? So the infant's immune response has to build, has to mature, needs multiple doses. But by vaccinating a pregnant person and getting those antibodies to the fetus, you're actually affording protection to the baby as well. There is transplacental transfer of antibodies. We know that. We know that even from non-vaccine-induced antibodies, right, just to, to even for group B strep, where you know it's an exposure, even from influenza antibodies that you can see from someone having had the illness. And we know that those antibodies cross somewhere starting around the mid-trimester, around 17 or 18 weeks. Some of the things I'll go into a little bit about pertussis vaccine, and you know that the recommendations for pertussis vaccine say to administer sometime after 27, 28 weeks. Those things were decided on by expert opinion because people thought that antibodies didn't really cross well after that. That's not exactly true. Uh, we've seen that there's nearly one-to-one -one trans, um, transfer across the placenta. So I only say that because we may start to see more and more vaccines administered during pregnancy, and we might want to consider spacing them out just from a standpoint of response. If we're really giving pertussis uh, vaccine because we're trying to protect the infant and we know someone's had two or three prior preterm births, should we be backing up when they get it if we really want to impart the best benefit? So it's just important to remember the antibodies cross. And this data, it has nothing to do with vaccines. You all probably know, but or may not think about it, but we all the data about antibody transfer comes from IC immunization or RH disease, when we know that maternal antibodies were crossing to the fetus and actually causing harm. So we should then leverage that for good from the standpoint of vaccines. So I put this up here just for completeness to know that there are these broad categories of vaccines. Um, you'll hear a lot of things, like when we were talking about COVID vaccine, when everyone came out and said, oh, it's safe because it's not a live virus vaccine. Well, that might be okay to say, except there's really actually never been any detrimental impact from a live virus vaccine, even given during pregnancy. We avoid it on theoretical basis because when you get, use a live virus vaccine, you technically get sort of a subclinical infection. There have been situations where individuals who've gotten, say, varicella vaccine have had um, varicella lesions, right, chickenpox lesions. 
very, very um, self-limiting short term, but it can happen. So we try to avoid that. Uh, but killed or inactivated vaccines, subunit vaccines, protein antigen-based vaccines, well, we still need to think about studying them. In general, they're in a safe, safe category. So we do avoid those live virus vaccines, um, but to date, there has never been a case of congenital rubella syndrome or congenital varicella from an individual who inadvertently got vaccinated, um, say, not realizing that she was pregnant um, or even early, early on knowing but needed the vaccine for some reason. So in general, we want to always think about when the benefits outweigh the risks. And if there's a potential for exposure versus infection, you could argue that with COVID, right? We were thinking about healthcare workers of childbearing age or pregnant. Was the risk of getting a vaccine um, greater or less than the risk of getting COVID itself? Um, does the infection cause harm to the mother or the fetus? For example, Zika virus, right? Women, when they got Zika themselves, had the illness but did okay. There were really no, no significant uh, cases of severe disease. Um, but we certainly know there was absolute fetal harm in most of those cases. Um, and if we know the vaccine is unlikely to harm the mother or fetus, then this is where we should be, we should be thinking from that perspective. <clears throat> Maternal immunization, though, is not a new story. There is really great historical art, um, artwork and depictions of individuals lined up for their smallpox vaccine where you saw women and children, pregnant women, lined up in those depictions, and this was from quite some time ago. Um, it, this, we know that from the uh, story from neonatal tetanus that we have been giving tetanus-containing, uh, tetanus toxoid-containing vaccines around the world uh, to try to eliminate neonatal tetanus. It's not something we think about a lot in the United States uh, because we have um, uh, clear hygiene uh, approaches for umbilical cord uh, clamping. But in many uh, low middle income countries, they may use um, other things to, uh, on the uh, cord stump um, to try to control bleeding and those sorts of things. And so that is a really significant source of neonatal tetanus, which is um, related to significant mortality. So the WHO has had a significant campaign to eliminate neonatal tetanus that involves multiple do doses of tetanus containing vaccine, two and even three doses over that time. And then the in influenza is uh, clear evidence that pregnant individuals do much worse during an influenza pandemic, dating back to the, uh, the 1950s, 1960s um, data that we have. So why are we talking about it now, right? Why is it important for everyone to be thinking about and do? Well, I think we'd all agree that the best way for us to try to improve the outcome of the newborn prior to it being born is to improve the health of the mother. So if we can ensure the best health for the mother, that's our, our only best approach to ensure a healthy newborn. Vaccines are really well proven to prevent infection and prevent disease. It's an underutilized intervention that's there. And quite frankly, other than new vaccines, when they've been around for a while, they're pretty inexpensive, right? So if you, if you buy in bulk, like your health system probably does, a flu vaccine costs a couple of dollars. Um, Tetanus-containing vaccines before the acellular pertussis vaccine were even less. Um, now, after the, the new acellular pertussis vaccines, we're probably talking about maybe 7 or $8. If you're doing multi-dose vials, it's even less. So if you look at the cost uh, that it is to implement vaccine programs, it doesn't make any sense but to do it. Uh, it has the potential to benefit important segments of the population, right? So if we're not thinking about, if we're thinking from the standpoint of pregnant individuals, it's kind of a three for one. We can protect the mother, we can protect the fetus, and we can protect the infant. So if you put that into your cost effectiveness analyses, it comes out even, even better. We also know, again, that in the case of emerging infectious diseases, that pregnant women have um, fared poorly uh, during um, things like Ebola, Zika, and now recently with COVID. There are lots of uncured perinatal and neonatal infections out there. So you may or may not realize that CMV is the number one cause of congenital malformation after Down syndrome. We can't do anything, at least right now, about preventing Down syndrome. I say at least right now because who knows where CRISPR technology and things like that are going. Um, but with regards to CMV, if we can get to a place where we have um, an effective vaccine, then we could actually be eliminating a significant amount of congenital disease that's related to that. And remember, it's not just malformation, right? It's a, a leading cause of hearing impairment um, and other neurocognitive uh, developmental things that often are not diagnosed be, being uh, related to CMV. So let's shift gears and talk about a few diseases and how that has fared in the course of pregnancy. So if influenza. 
about 20 to 30 percent illness incidents in the United States on a regular basis. This is not talking necessarily about pandemic situations. And then it's estimated about 10 percent of uh, pregnant women will have a documented case of influenza through laboratory confirmed illness, but we know that most people don't go, right, to get tested. So it's estimated um, using the factors that go into that underreporting to extrapolate that somewhere around a million pregnant people annually will have influenza. They're five times more likely to die or be hospitalized with severe complications, and there's a significantly increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So it makes sense that flu vaccine, right, would be beneficial. But we didn't really have good data. Um, and so this study that was, um, that was conducted by the folks from Johns Hopkins um, and conducted in Bangladesh was actually one of the first trials that demonstrated improved outcomes related to influenza in mothers and infants. The funny thing is, I know that Marianne would know, this is the study that um, uh, Mark Steinoff's group uh, did in Bangladesh, and they actually, interestingly enough, were trying to figure out a way to reduce invasive pneumococcal disease in the children, right? Which is, again, in something in the obstetrics world we don't see, right? It happens after the fact. So they actually randomized um, pregnant women to get pneumococcal vaccine, and they used influenza vaccine as a control arm because they wanted um, everyone to have some benefit for participating in the study. But then what happened was they found a significant improvement in the individuals who received influenza vaccine. So they saw a, you know, a third reduction in maternal respiratory illness and fever, two-thirds reduction in laboratory-confirmed illness, and then a, a 30 percent or so reduction in infant febrile illness. So this was the first data where we had you know, clear randomized control data to show that there was actually benefit um, to pregnant women. We were giving flu vaccine in this country before that, but this was the first time that it was actually um, clear. Now, when this was published, though, I say we were giving flu vaccine in this country. Um, I'll come back to that one second. But here's actually the data showing um, from antibody levels that were measured. So the, on the left, you see the mothers um, and the, from the baseline where they got before they got their immunization, they had antibody titers, and you can see them rise significantly. They recheck then at delivery. And on the right is actually at birth is cord blood. And you can see here that the levels are nearly identical between the mothers and the infant cord blood. And that's, again, demonstrating that active transport that happens with the FC receptor from across the placenta to get those antibodies to the baby. You see that they taper off, though, and drop pretty significantly, right, because they normally decay. And hopefully, right, if you're looking at another condition like in pertussis, where we need the infants to be protected, we add the vaccine and it will, it will catch up on those antibodies afterwards. But why I brought up the other one, other point about 2008 was it was not actually until 2010 that the CDC ACIP recommended universal influenza vaccine coverage. Prior to that, we had this really what I would call crazy scheme of how to figure out who needed flu vaccine. So it was anyone uh, less than 18. But once you hit 18, then it was, I think, it jumped up to age 50. And if you're between ages 18 and 50, then it was if you had, if you were a smoker, if you had diabetes, if you had, you know, all these conditions. And when you put all those together, it turned out about 65% of the population qualified for vaccines. That was a lot more work <laughs> um, than to just give the vaccine. And in addition, the fact giving the vaccine didn't cause harm. It was simply that uh, in, in, in the beginning, it's always a cost analysis to figure out what's the right approach. So in 2010, we went to recommendation for anyone six months of age and older should get influenza vaccine. So then what happened in 2009-10? It's really funny to me to think, funny, not really, truly funny, but just so interesting how long ago that was now. It doesn't feel like that long ago. Um, we've lived through several pandemics of different things now. Um, but this is a reminder to say in 2009-10, we had the H1N1 influenza pandemic. And you can see here that uh, during 2009, what happened, that the, um, I, I liken this to what we've experienced recently, that we actually had airport screening of inbound passengers. I didn't even remember that until I went and looked at this data to see what we were doing about travel across the world, um, to see when the first cases were reported in the United States, um, when we got vaccine. Um, we actually, it, it's interesting to think, we actually had COVID vaccine available faster than we had H1N1 flu vaccine, um, or about the same time frame, I think, actually. Um, and it had to do with, you know, our mechanisms of how we actually create flu vaccine, which is really cumbersome, um, using an egg-based uh, culture uh, process 
Um, we're doing studies still. We have recombinant vaccine, but it hasn't really picked up and caught on um, in the way that we thought it would from the standpoint of being able to generate quickly. Some of that still has to do with how we decide on what strains go in influenza vaccines, um, and that gets um, really cumbersome as well and puts us behind. Um, I have to give credits for this picture to my, one of my former fellows, Kim Fortner, who's actually at UT Knoxville. Um, she worked with me during the pandemic, and she had this picture, and I was like, I just can't pass it up. I just keep using it, even though it's quite old. Um, so at the time, we were trying to figure out what we were going to do in pregnancy. We knew the data that was coming out, um, particularly from the studies, some of the studies from the CDC and data out of a couple of hospitals in California that pregnant women were dying, were dying of H1N1. Um, we're getting them into the ICUs, we're on ventilators and so forth. From the standpoint of the vaccine, there was not a, it wasn't difficult to create a vaccine, but no one knew at the time, it's just like what we've experienced recently. Could one dose be enough? Did we need two doses? What was the right dose? What if you had underlying immunologic conditions? Was the right dose in pregnancy going to be the same? So we didn't really know, and we needed to figure it out. So we were with one of our um, vaccine networks through the NIH. Um, we were a site uh, at Duke University as well to enroll pregnant women into a dose-ranging study. Um, the, for all of you who do clinical research, every time you sit and design a study and you look at your estimates for how to get people enrolled and you try to figure out the feasibility, and then you think, okay, we can enroll in uh, you know, eight months. It, you almost always should double it, right? Like it never works the way that you think it will. We enrolled 120 women across five sites in four weeks. Um, and we had people lined up and lined up after that, right, for the studies. And I'm sure that that's been some of the case with COVID vaccine um, early on, right, to get, get individuals enrolled. But what we did was enroll people into this phase two study to look at two doses. So everyone got two vaccine doses, but also at two dose levels. So we did it at the standard level and then a double dose as well. So you can see here using um, HAA titers, which are basically the antibody titers to look at seroprotection from vaccines. So at baseline, both groups, so the green bars are the lower dose and the blue bar is the double dose of that. And you can see that at baseline, these women did not have H1N1 related antibodies. After one dose, right, so they got the dose on that day and then about three weeks later we measured their antibodies, you can see that they were, everyone was above 90% protected. They got a second dose that day to see, could we boost that further and did we need that? But you can see if you compare that to the bars the next uh, further down, wasn't much change. So we were able to use that data to say that a single low dose was adequate to protect pregnant women at the same level that we were protecting non-pregnant individuals. So that's the kind of thing we needed in COVID as well, and I'll get to where we did not have that data in just a minute. But I want to just put in a plug about advocacy here, and I'll come back to this again. What did we do during that time? How did we help our patients? How did we help each other to figure out what to do, right? Patients are calling all the time. What should I do? And what should I do to protect myself? Should I get the vaccine? Should I not? It's a lot to keep up with, right? So how do you know where to go? What are your trusted sources? So um, as part of the uh, American College of OBGYN, as well as the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, there are organized groups focused on all these various diseases. So in ACI, we have a immunization work group. Um, SMFM has an infectious disease work group, uh, and they sort of merge over that. So we develop guidelines on how to assess and treat at the time of H1N1, we still were questioning whether oseltamivir or Tamiflu was safe to use in pregnancy. Um, it was insane. I'm sure you had the same experience here uh, to say we have a woman who's in the ICU and is going to be intubated, but we don't know if we can give Tamiflu if it's okay for a baby. And you're thinking, this doesn't make any sense <laughs> that someone's oxygen saturation is diminishing and we're talking about whether Tamiflu is going to be you know, problematic. Um, so, putting out guidelines is really helpful. I want to say, even though I don't have it listed here, um, the American College of OBGYN in particular has a very, very um, well-built collaboration and relationship now with the American Academy of Pediatrics, because I think that is crucial uh, to be able to have the same messaging between the obstetricians and the pediatricians. Messaging to the patients, messaging to each other, uh, and messaging to the families, you know, about what, what to come. Um, it's also important to try to address the ethical issues. So I really appreciate the efforts that ACOG has put forth and SMFM to think about the ethical issues taking care of, of pregnant women during these times. 
So if we get back then to the flu vaccine story, um, this is actually a, that, that Zayman article that I showed you was only about 150 or 300 women, I think, 150 that got flu vaccine. So the Gates Foundation actually funded multiple, um, three different studies. And this is data actually out of South Africa where they enrolled over 2,000 pregnant women um, who were HIV seronegative uh, because they did a study in HIV positive individuals who did have diminished antibody response. Um, so that is where being immunocompromised or further immunomodulated is important to know. Um, but this was another study that really was helpful to look at a large number, not just a small sort of pilot study type of thing, to be able to prove the same thing. And they found the same findings. What they didn't find, though, was what Gates was really interested in at the time was, um, and still is, is what are the efforts we can put forward to reduce under five mortality, right? So it's really hard to make sure we're getting adequate vaccines of all the kids. Sometime during the course of pregnancy, as I said before, right, we're gonna see that person for care. Um, most countries um, in, in the, the WHO has set forth have a sort of four antenatal care visit model. So somewhere over that uh, at minimum, and so somewhere over that time, if you could administer vaccines, we could lead to that prevention. And so this is one of the really um, founding studies that has been used with um, international organizations like WHO, Gavi, and CEPI to really push forward for vaccines in, in this population. So I shift gears to pertussis, um, whooping cough that uh, came around again in around 2008, 2009. It never really went away. I think we just didn't hear about it a lot. I think folks in the pediatric critical care space were probably the only ones that were really paying good attention um, to the disease. It's highly contagious, it is, uh, has significant complications. It's a bacterial infection. I think that's one of the things that's a little bit different um, than some of the viral illnesses that we have dealt with in our pandemic times. Uh, but it was identified first in the early 1900s. Uh, whole cell pertussis vaccine was developed in the 1930s. And around the 1940s, when we had good case documentation, there were roughly 200,000 cases a year in the U.S. So most of the data I'm talking about, of course, is U.S.-based. But why are we talking about it again now? Um, so around 2008, 2009-ish, we started to see an uptick in pertussis. And I'll show you what that data looks like. But there is uh, certainly were issues with waning immunity um, related to the vaccine that we use now. Um, which is an acellular pertussis vaccine. There were issues with the whole cell pertussis vaccine, which I'll mention. We also have better recognition and surveillance, right? We're doing um, the, the testing with PCR is highly more um, reliable than some of the culture-based tests that were done in the past. Doesn't mean culture is obsolete, um, but we just have to make sure we have good cultures, right, to do them. There's also, we know, decreasing vaccine coverage rates. Um, where were little pockets of pertussis outbreaks for sure. Um, there's variances in the vaccine potency between the whole cell and the acellular pertussis. And there's also probably something that most of us in my age range and above um, are in a better, better position about pertussis protection because of being primed with the whole cell vaccine first. So here's what we were seeing in the 2001 to 2009 timeframe. We were seeing that um, there was an increase in pertussis incidence in infants but you can see here that the, uh, the, the primary uh, sort of peak is in those first few months of life. DTAP is the diphtheria, tetanus, acellular pertussis vaccine. You get three doses by the time you're six months of age. And you can see the rapid decline after that, somewhere after about the second dose that the infants are protected. Why is that important? You see the high incidence in the first month of life. Then if you look at that related to hospitalization and death, all of those cases are occurring early on in life. The vaccine series is not going to be able to do anything to protect those most at-risk infants in the early part of life. So here now, if we step back and look at pertussis at large, you can see uh, where I was pointing to the whole cell vaccine developed in the 1940s. You can see a nice decline. There always are these sort of cyclical pertussis outbreaks, and that's where you see the sort of spikes go back up and down. Um, and then around the 1990s, late 90s or so, um, the acellular pertussis vaccine was introduced. Um, so one of um, my former, one of my still long-standing mentors and uh, uh, co-friends uh, with, uh, with Dean Jackson is a woman named Kathy Edwards, who's at Vanderbilt. And she, Kathy, uh, dedicated a significant part of her life's work to pertussis vaccine development. And whole cell pertussis vaccine was very good at preventing pertussis. It also was very good at causing other side effects, particularly uh, significant 
incidence of um, febrile seizure and other neurologic sequela was not common, meaning it didn't happen to every child, but it happened enough that it was not really acceptable. And so it really led us to look for an equivalent, if not better, vaccine. Acellular pertussis was tested in head-to-head -head studies for immune um, response or antibodies and was found to be effective, and we changed to that. But a few years after that, you see the incidence started creeping up. And then around uh, 2008 or so, you can see that um, it went up even more significantly, and that's when we introduced the acellular pertussis vaccine to adults, or Tdap. And then that inset there shows you the, the end of that, uh, that period even a little bit better. So who was getting pertussis, right? So if you look here, the green line actually shows you the children less than a year of age. That's the majority of cases. But look at the other lines, right? So it's not as if it was only occurring in the children. The children had to get it from somewhere. Um, they weren't getting it from other babies, right? They were getting it from the adults. They were getting it from their siblings. They were getting it from their grandparents and so forth. So the first strategy that was recommended was something called cocooning. And the CDC and ACIP recommended this idea that said if you basically surround the infant with protection, meaning get, make sure everyone around that infant doesn't have pertussis by making sure they're vaccinated, then we should be able to decrease their incidence of pertussis. So they recommended that it should be administered to women in the postpartum period, close contacts of infants, healthcare personnel with direct patient contact, but that it, it could be administered in pregnancy if the risk was deemed to outweigh the benefit. I don't know what that means. No other obstetricians knew what that meant. They didn't see pertussis. They didn't see children with pertussis. That didn't really work, right? Um, most people, there was also this, if you had gotten your last tetanus at least two years ago. I don't know about you, but most people don't remember when they got their last tetanus vaccine. Um, hospitals were supposed to be giving it in the postpartum period. No one told the hospitals, no one told the obstetricians, suddenly we were just supposed to be doing it. Who was going to pay it? Was it included in the package? Could we charge for it separately? These are all the questions, right, that your hospital P&T committee will ask you. And you're like, I just want to give it, right? That's what you keep saying, and then it doesn't happen. Um, it also fails to leverage what I talked about before, which is transfer of antibodies across the placenta to protect the infant directly. So. We posed this question, again, through our uh, NIH vaccine network, is could we actually administer a vaccine during pregnancy to improve the outcome or prevent pertussis in the infant? And lo and behold, it worked. Um, we <clears throat> enrolled pregnant women in a, um, in a crossover study where two-thirds of them got the vaccine in pregnancy, the other third got placebo, and then postpartum, they got the vaccine if they'd gotten placebo. So that way, everyone was protected. Their families were protected after that. And we followed the, their children through one year of age. And um, I have to say, for one credit to the FDA, for we've come a long way. At the time of when we were doing the study, they required us to do Bailey, um, Bailey 3 screening tests with all the infants. I think it takes about four or five hours to do a Bailey test with the infants. Um, and I'm not sure that it really found a whole lot much that would not be able to be uh, um, identified readily, especially among 48 children, right, to have the clarity. But we identified there were no serious adverse events, that there were no uh, concerns about the infant. There's also a concern about whether giving the vaccine to pregnant people, exposing the fetus, might impact the infant's own response to its own vaccine series. And that's something people talk about with blunting. Like, are we going to impact the infant's ability to generate enough antibodies when it gets vaccinated? That didn't happen either. So that's where we got to pertussis vaccine in pregnancy. But what we did was we changed pretty rapidly. And at first we said, let's give Tdap vaccine to unvaccinated postpartum women and their families. We started to see an, an increase again. Then we changed to give Tdap to unvaccinated second and third trimester pregnant individuals and postpartum. And then that was too hard because again, how did you tell who was unvaccinated? OBGYN offices often don't have access to the state immunization registries. They don't have access to adolescent uh, postpartum, uh, excuse me, adolescent vaccine receipt. Um, so it got to be where that was not really feasible. And we recommended Tdap for every pregnancy, regardless of what the vaccination status is. And we've seen a significant decline, not to zero, but a significant decline. Um, we also then looked to see if giving multiple Tdap vaccines repeatedly would be of any concern. And we looked at that in about 375 pregnant women and another 225 non-pregnant women so we could have a control group. 
Um, and this is a study that we did uh, in our CDC vaccine network um, at, at Duke and at Vanderbilt. And we found that by that time, about 50% of pregnant women had received a Tdap vaccine in adult life. Um, so that was actually good to know that people were actually getting it. But the responses were the same between pregnant and non-pregnant people as far as fever or, or pain at the injection site or any sort of symptoms. So that was confirmatory for the CDC's recommendations and has been, helped, uh, has been cited to help support that. It, it's hard to not mention things about COVID. I'm not going to make this a talk about COVID other than to say that um, you all very, no, very much know and have probably experienced the unfortunate impact of COVID on pregnant women. Um, particularly uh, from the standpoint of morbidity and unfortunate mortality as well. So in the fall of 2020, we were having many conversations about what to do. How should we think about COVID-19 vaccines and pregnancy? And now I want to focus this on thinking about the pregnant person. Of course, again, knowing there would be benefit to the infant in some capacity if we can improve the health of the pregnant person. But data and safety uh, data, in particular on these vaccines during pregnancy and lactation, right, should really, we're, we're really at the forefront that we needed to get this data in order to be able to make recommendations. That lacking this kind of data could um, particularly put pregnant individuals at even greater risk because you might have, let's face it, who are the majority of people in the healthcare setting? If you look at um, an essential workers are predominantly women of childbearing age. Somewhere around 60% of the healthcare force are actually women under the age of 50. Um, so we needed to prioritize this and to wait and rely on post-market surveillance, which means let's just see what happens, is always fraught with difficulty. Where's the source of truth? How do we know that is the case when we don't have comparison? What we should have done was follow um, some sort of strategy that we would for any other vaccine development under an IND, like with the FDA. Phase one are these small studies. Phase two go to larger scale studies, like some of the ones that I described, and phase three are really big. We knew that we didn't have a lot of time for phase three studies. We were waiting right desperately, all of us, for the phase three studies that were underway. So some of the things that we could have done would have been to think about allowing pregnant and lactating individuals to enroll in the phase three study, right? add an additional arm, follow the exact same protocol, but let's include a small group of pregnant or lactating individuals. We could have done a phase two companion studies that would have gone along with that. right? And one of the things that we were pushing on with the FDA um, was to ask Pfizer and Moderna to consider starting one of those studies when they had gone through their DSMB reviews. So once they knew right, confidentially that they were at a point where they didn't have a safety concern, where they should have seen something um, by that point, that we could have started some companion studies, or had the studies ready to go the day after an EUA or, to, or an approval. <clears throat> but that's not where we ended up. <laughs> and where we ended up was um, pregnant women being excluded um, from all clinical trials prior to the EUA for um, both of the mRNA vaccines and the J&J &J vaccine as well. Um, I think it's important to know that there's plenty of work, though, going on in other vaccines um, with regards to um, pregnant women and with regards to children or uh, young infants. Um, we're looking at things related to CMV virus development. We're looking at things related to group E strep virus vaccine development and RSV vaccine as well. But at the end of the day, um, what we had to rely on was expert opinion. And from the advocacy perspective, I have to say that this was an excellent example of the CDC, ACOG, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, uh, Society for Reproductive Medicine, because of all the things that you've heard about related to fertility, um, fertility treatments, anticipation that this could be harmful, um, and also um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, that we all got on the same page about what our recommendations were. So I want to put a plug in. Last thing I'll just touch on for all of you is, um, at least for me during the times of COVID and trying to figure out how to still be um, motivationally productive. I think we were all productive because we had to be. But how did we keep up our um, sort of academic pursuit? How did we know that we were contributing in some way beyond that? And I think advocacy um, doesn't always mean you have to go to the march, that you have to be on the front line. How do you do that? Um, from your desk at your home working remotely. Um, how do you advocate for that? How do you make sure that the people who are making decisions are hearing from us? Um, and so see, these are some of the groups that I'm involved in and that others should be thinking about how they can be involved in if they want to be. 
I like to always end a talk about the motivation for me too. Uh, many of you probably recognize some of the individuals here. Um, these are who I look at as my, um, my mentors, some of my lifelong mentors. I know that Gary knows at least one of those people, um, and Marianne knows of some of those as well. Um, and so these are people that I looked at early in my career as mentors, and now I would tell you they are my advocates and sponsors. If it wasn't for Kathy Edwards, I wouldn't know Marianne. I wouldn't have probably been on some of those vaccine advisory committees where I've been able to advocate for pregnant women amongst all other infectious disease experts in adult and pediatrics. Very few obstetrician gynecologists who are a part of that. Um, this is my group of people who I look at as my current mentors, my current um, advocates and current sponsors. And so it's important to know that you need that all along your career. It's not just at the beginning, and then once you get over the hump, you know what you're doing. You always need a sounding board and need people to be there to guide you and help you. And then last but not least, I can't forget uh, the people who always support me every day in doing all these things. So thank you all. So and that's been my, um, my uh, claim to advocacy and some of the things I got to do. When I was on the screen with Wolf Blitzer, I have to say I was sweating, and I don't usually uh, actually sweat that much when I'm, I'm talking. So, <laughs> so uh, before I ask for questions from the, from the audience, uh, my first question is about advocacy. You know, we, we all have patients, pregnant patients, for example, who are vaccine hesitant. And, you know, early on, it was easy to engage them and convince some of them mm -hmm. to do it. But now there's, it now it's turned into yeah. resistance. And, <clears throat> yeah. you know, all these organizations, what should they do to get that message out? I feel like the, the vaccine-resistant individuals are hearing a message out there, mm -hmm. and there's yeah. not enough of a counter-message for them. Yeah, I mean, it, it is very hard because, um, you know, it, it's not a whole lot different than what I see is um, dealing with other medical uh, preventive strategies like for obesity or for, you know, diabetes care, or for nutrition exercise. And, and what I mean by that is it doesn't, it's not going to happen in one conversation. Um, what we'd really like to be able to do is write a prescription and they get it filled and they take it, right? We'd really like for them to simply get vaccinated at that moment. And there's a lot of good data showing that you have to figure out where that person is coming from. What is the issue that they're dealing with? Is it family um, perspective? Is it that they have read something that's untrue? Is it that they have a distrust of the medical community? Is it that they have had a bad experience with the vaccine? Um, if you don't start to figure out the why, just keep telling them the same thing that this organization recommends it. I got my vaccine. You should too. You're not meeting them where they are. And I think that's actually part of the issue that we have not, to be honest, gotten very well trained in medical training on how to do that, on how to figure out where the patients are with their beliefs, with their acceptance, um, with how they want to be cared for um, and how they want to partner in that. So I don't have an easy answer other than to say we haven't figured it out and we can't get frustrated. We have to look at it just by any other preventive strategy that we need to try to implement. Thank you. Uh Dr. Spani, that was an excellent presentation. I'm a pediatrician, neonatologist, and uh, I'm also cognizant of the prevalence of malaria and the recent development of malaria vaccine. Any knowledge that you can share with us about that as it may pertain to pregnant women around the world? And again, though, we have a pretty big Zoom audience, so can okay. you repeat just a little bit of that? Sure, absolutely. So the question was specifically about malaria vaccine and what we know about it during the course of pregnancy. Um, obviously, um, some of you may know malaria in um, endemic areas is incredibly um, uh, morbid uh, in the course of pregnancy. There are, there are actually some studies underway um, involving uh, a company called Scenaria, and they use the sporozyte. They actually use live sporozytes in the vaccine and administer that intravenously. Those studies are underway. Um, there are some other studies, and there are planned studies uh, with malaria um, in, in pregnancy. One of the issues, though, comes back to that sort of nature of how many doses do we need, um, and it's the same story with, like, for example, with CMV. There's a lot of discussion about whether we should be giving CMV vaccine as a prime dose in adolescence and then potentially boosting during early pregnancy. Because, you know, you don't really get enough antibodies unless you're exposed. 
um, we don't really want them to be exposed for something like CMV because it might really be a reactivation or new strain. So how do we manage that? So that's one of the debates about the malaria situation is because if someone already has it and you give them the vaccine, are you potentially going to overwhelm uh, the placenta with, um, with load, right, of sporozytes and so forth? So no one's exactly clear. But there are actually some studies that are being planned. Um, NIAID um, supported in the background in some of them as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Ann, I think you should have gotten first dibs even before Gary. <laughs> well, first off, I just want to say thank you. We're so proud to have you here at UMKC and for you to be our inaugural speaker at the HSD Research Advisory Council. Um, so I want to tell you that my heart is full today. And the reason for this is this is the first in-person conference I've been at, literally in a conference like this, uh, since the start of the pandemic. You and I talked last night over dinner that our major conferences where we're allowed to network with people, our colleagues that we value so much and energize us in what we do within our profession, that, that we've had situations where just right before we thought we were going in person, they canceled and we were uh, virtual again. So we're so grateful that you're here. It just really fills my heart. And, it, and actually, you triggered so many memories of being with you and, and Kathy and NVAC uh, together and sharing coffee in the morning uh, ahead of all the work. So my question for you is this. Um, of the three vaccines in the pipeline that you mentioned, uh, malaria notwithstanding, but CMV, RSV, and grippy strep, mm -hmm. which one is going to get to the finish line first? And when is that finish line happening? Yeah. So thank you again for being here. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Thank you for having me. So, um, well, <laughs> it's funny because I think if you'd asked me that a year ago, I wouldn't have had CMV on the, on the list at all, um, meaning as a, as a front runner. Um, and it'll be interesting because I think we're going to hear data from Moderna pretty soon about their mRNA-based CMV vaccine in non-pregnant people. Um, I think in this calendar year, we're going to hear what that shows. So that, that, that will be very interesting to see what that finds. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure, though, given what we've learned in the COVID situation with mRNA-based vaccines and what their, um, the, the long-term immunity looks like. So we'll have to see. Um, I think that the GSK RSV platform is rather advanced, um, and Pfizer's right behind them. Um, but Pfizer's groupie strep program is what is one that I think could be um, a, a monumental shift from the standpoint of pregnancy, if we can get that vaccine going forward. And the reason I say that is because, again, in the obstetric space, we focus on um, groupie strep prevention. For, uh, and we've done a really good job in this country at preventing early onset disease. As obstetricians, we don't know a thing about late onset disease. We don't see it. It's out of mind, out of sight. It's not something we deal with. In addition to the fact that an screening an antibiotic prophylaxis intrapartum does nothing for GBS contributing to stillbirth, early uh, miscarriage, preterm labor, and so forth. So it could have an impact across the board on so many aspects of groupie strep that I'm really hoping that that's going to be um, it be something that will go forward. But I think, to be honest, they're, they're kind of neck and neck in phase three studies between those two conditions. So, uh, We have a, a Zoom question. And uh, the Zoom question is uh, uh, posed by one of our PGY3 okay. residents, uh, Alan Garib, who's applying for MFM this year. And I recommend uh, that you interview him. <laughs> All right. I'll make sure. <laughs> Send me your uh, information. OK. <laughs> Uh, but Dr. Garib um, asks, uh, you can see he talks about the gaps um, in uh, the FDA and IRB barriers to research on pregnant patients that you touched upon. And he asks, how do we move forward to advocate for pregnant patients to be included in research while still protecting them as vulnerable populations? Yeah, right. Absolutely. So, so I think a, a couple things. Well, there has been movement on this, right? So for the, uh, those of us who have been doing this research now for, say, 20, 30, 40 years, um, it was nearly impossible to get uh, research done in pregnant women. And as someone who does work in vaccines, no industry sponsors were at all even remotely interested on doing a study in pregnant women. Just didn't want to deal with it. And some of that had to do with the RSV vaccine stories um, from the formal inactive vaccine that led to problems. And then um, groupie strep vaccine that didn't really pan out. And then they just gave up. 
So some of the things that have changed um, have been um, purposeful and some maybe not so purposeful. Uh, one of the things that helped in the FDA was that there were actually OBGYNs working in the FDA for a while. Jeff Roberts, um, who actually just recently FDA, left FDA, was an OBGYN, and he was high up in, the, um, in CBER in the vaccine space. And that actually gave us an audience, someone to talk with directly. Um, but in the setting of uh, regulatory space for IRBs and so forth, you know, the, um, the common rule, which governs all the Code of Federal Regulations that governs research in all human beings and all human participants, changed. So we actually, um, and this is a good thing, we no longer classify pregnant women as a vulnerable population. And why I say that is a good thing, because the government defines vulnerable as someone who cannot make a decision for themselves or someone who uh, has a potential to be coerced. Now, I would argue that that might be the case for um, a pregnant person, an adolescent, um, or someone who might have other impairment, but that shouldn't be the going in stance that pregnant people are vulnerable. Are they at risk? Are there other situations that we need to factor in? The only reason that a pregnant person is in any such category is because there's more than the pregnant person to consider, right? So how do we think about that differently? There, there are ways. I think if you have a situation locally or wherever you end up practicing or whatnot where your IRB has a stance that they're really anti, really not very you know, welcoming of that, um, it's an opportunity to have conversations with them. One of the things as someone who uh, oversees our IRB is sometimes it can't be things you're just submitting online in a system, things that you're writing in emails. You need to have a phone call. You need to talk through it. You need to figure out how to get over those hurdles, right? And I will say one of the reasons that we've been really successful at Duke is that our former um, IRB uh, leader for many, many years was a man named John Folletta, who was a pediatric oncologist. Mm -hmm. So we can talk all about how pregnant individuals are at risk or potentially vulnerable, but let's talk about really young children with cancer who need potentially rather toxic drugs, right, to treat them. So people were not gung-ho about that either, right? You know, they're like, do I put my child at risk? for this drug where I see the side effects are terrible versus facing you know, death without them. So he was really rather courageous in helping to change a lot of that stance. Um, and you know, having, it's actually feasible to have conversations with the FDA too. It takes time. So all of these things are a long road. So you can't get frustrated um, the first time someone tells you no. You gotta figure out the why um, and meet those people at the same place and figure out how to get past it. May I make a comment? <clears throat> Thank you first. An incredible presentation. I have been in obstetrics a long period of time, three continents. India, uh, England, and over here, Europe, and here. So I've seen some of these slides that you presented, evolution of many of these actually experienced in practice. And we are in a far better place today it's unfortunate we have to go through the COVID. So thank you profoundly, and thank you, Lynn Jackson, for making this possible, and the Health Sciences District for sponsoring this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question from Zoom Land, um, which is uh, one of our, uh, our MFM fellows. Okay. Uh, Tracy Johnson, who asked, I have been hearing whispers of an HIV vaccine. Any word on this, or is this urban legend? <laughs> and, uh, well, not it's not urban legend, um, but we're not quite there yet. I think um, there have been HIV vaccines that were tested. Um, I think the last time we had a, a significant HIV vaccine trial had to be probably 10, 12 years ago now. Um, there are still vaccines in development. There's actually a lot of work on that um, at Duke and at um, University of Washington um, at, uh, and so forth. And you know, one of the things that, um, that where we might actually, again, if there's any silver lining to COVID, what we're going to learn from some of the experiences is that um, I think people have decided the only way to get to a proper um, HIV preventive vaccine is to get something that produces what are called broadly neutralizing antibodies. So we can't go after one specific protein or one specific antigen target um, because of the um, mutation rate, because of the way that the virus um, works to, to get around those things. 
those are in development, and I actually think there's going to be, um, again, work that is going to be beneficial from SARS-CoV-2 broadly neutralizing antibody vaccine studies as well. So it's not dead, um, but I don't think we're going to have anything anytime soon on HIV prevention. Yeah, broadly neutralizing sounds really promising. <laughs> yeah, if we can get there. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I have a question in terms of the vaccine hesitancy and defiance that we're um, experiencing. Is there any sort of programs that are doing community-based efforts to try to combat um, the epidemic of uh, misinformation? Well, the misinformation stuff is a problem, right? We haven't figured out how to manage that um, I mean, the Spotify, <laughs> Spotify experience recently is a, is a tough one. I literally, I mean, I kid you not, I uh, uh, closed my Pandora account because my kids told me that was ridiculous. They were like, Pandora is terrible. You need to get on Spotify, Mom. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I closed it down, and then all of that happened. I was like, now what do I do? I don't have any music. So, so I'm going to give that up for a little while and figure <laughs> out what to do. But at the same time, I'm like, how do, we, how do we combat this if we don't figure out how to do that? So I... You know, the, we'll get there, but I think part of the problem is it's very, very easy to disseminate misinformation rather quickly. It's much harder to coalesce and combine and contribute um, trustworthy information in a way that we, uh, you know, get together and do that, right? For someone to put misinformation out there, all it takes is me putting it out there and click. And someone picks it up and picks it up and picks it up. For us to put a campaign of information out there, we've got to go through our societies. We have to go through our medical boards. We have to go through our health systems. It's not an excuse, except that it just doesn't happen as quickly. We just can't get those things done. There are studies, though, that are, that are ongoing um, about how to help patients um, identify the source. And I think that's one of the things that we have to do. Like when people say, I read this, um, I ask them. I really do ask them. I go, can you show me where you found that? Or can you, next time when you come in, can you print that? Can we see where that is? Do you know who wrote that? Um, and, you know, it, it, it can help for them to sort of look at you and go, oh, I didn't think about that, right? And, you know, I think until we get smart, as smart as the bots and the, you know, Twitter accounts that just feed forward all the bad information, we've got to get smart at the opposite. Uh, but somehow those campaigns always come off a little corny, they come off a little bit too um, highbrow. Like, I don't know how, how to make it at the same level or place that people feel like that, that's good information from them as well. I think we have to look to younger people, to be honest. I think we need to be looking at you know, our college students and our medical students and our trainees on how they think they receive information and people they know at their age groups are receiving information because they're way smarter at that stuff than we are. That's true. So. That is true. Thank you. All right, well, there are no other questions. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Weisskopf and Dean Melcher from the UMKC Health Science District Research Advisory Council up here. Thank you. Uh, once again, just a quick note of thanks to our Health Sciences District partners, especially Children's Mercy Hospital and University Health, and thanks Huge thanks to Allison, who keeps us all together on a daily basis. But, uh, of course, for today, thank you, Dr. Swami, for an outstanding presentation, very informative. Uh, we hope you enjoyed your time here in Kansas City, and you're welcome back anytime. Uh, and so thank you so much. We have just a token to thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody for coming as well, especially on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you so much.